Nope, mine's in this purple. Congress, Father, and Heaven, we're so thankful for the testimony of our Lord. Karen, I just ask you to tell how to prosper us and pray for you. You know, someone here that doesn't understand the relationship with faith in Christ and the salvation of the faith, I'm not saying that for you. I pray that you would be with all those that are on the prayer list and how many that are seeking healing and those that just need to be looking on and wrapped around them. pray that you would have your will done in each and every one of those cases. pray that you would forgive for each other and pray for preaching services. And I ask these things in my son. Number three, twelve. Three, twelve. <clears throat>
Touch everyone here in a special way. Bless this offering now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
chapter number 1, if you'll meet me in verse number 13 and stand for the reading of the word, please. Acts 1, verse number 13 is where we'll begin reading. When they were coming in, they went up into an upper room where both, both Peter and James and John, and Andrew and Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer, supplication with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with the brethren. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of, his, of the disciples, and said the number of the names together were about 120 Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spoke before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Now turn over to chapter number 2 and verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. You can be seated this morning. Studying the book of Acts, a brand new study that we started just a couple of weeks ago, or maybe three weeks ago, and we're in this first part where we see the church of the living God. Of course, it is a local church. It was the very first church which was started with Jesus in his earthly ministry here. And we see the church in these early chapters of the book of Acts standing for Jesus in hard times. I just ask you this question right off the bat this morning. I don't want any, la any answers out loud or any looking around, but just answer for yourself. How, as a church, how are we doing standing for Jesus in this day? As we view the list of names, the apostles and such that were gathered there in that upper room, that day we see some real heroes of the faith, uh, martyrs of the faith, James and John, the sons of thunder, James and John. They were there when Jesus was transformed on the Mount of Transfiguration. They were there uh, to walk with Jesus in His earthly ministry. John was there at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified. But there's one name that strikes out and sticks out in these opening chapters of the book of Acts. Uh, one name that stands above, and that is the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter was found standing in these verses that we just read. The Apostle Peter, by the time uh, we get to the first, the first of the book of Acts, Peter has found his voice. That may sound like a strange statement to make, so let me qualify it. Peter has found his right voice. Now, we know Peter to have been, uh, to uh, occasionally, you could, uh, you could say that Peter was one of those who had lost his mind and found his mouth along the way. He, he had the, 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 the problem with his mouth, but that's not what I'm talking about. He had found his voice for Jesus, his voice to stand for Christ in the day of trouble, and in the day of trials. Real quickly this morning, I want to answer a question, and that is, what happened to Peter? What happened to the Apostle Peter that he would become a great voice for the Lord Jesus Christ in the early days of the church? First of all, and write this down, point number one, Peter had had a personal encounter with the Lord. John chapter number one, Peter was approached by his own brother, a man named Andrew, who is also in that list of the apostles. We don't know much about Andrew except for one great thing. He led the apostle Peter to the Lord. He introduced him to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, come, we have found the Messiah. And he took him and introduced him to the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad for the people in your life that introduced you to the Lord Jesus Christ? Those preachers and those Sunday school teachers and the parents or whoever it was, those that were in your life, divinely appointed to you that they might introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for them. Matthew chapter number 4, Peter had a personal visit from the Lord. The Lord 
uh, Jesus met them down there by the Sea of Galilee and they were mending their nets, it says, and Jesus extended the invitation to them to come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Come and follow me. The invitation was extended, but the time to accept it was right now. Drop your nets right now and come and follow me. We could say it like this. It may have been a now or never situation. If Peter and Andrew and James and John had not left their nets and followed after the Lord that day, we're not promised that they would have ever had another opportunity to do so. Can I tell you this morning that your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ or your surrendering to His call on your life, it may be a now or never situation. I'm not, guaranteed, I'm not saying that that's the way it for sure is. You may have tomorrow to get saved. You may have next year to surrender your life to Christ. But it may be now or never. There may not ever be another opportunity this side of heaven to, uh, to, to, to make things right with the Lord. Now or never. Based upon Peter's public testimony, we can assume, or I do assume, that he accepted Christ as his Savior. Mark chapter number 8, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? They said, Well, some said that you're Elijah. Others say that you're some other prophet. And Jesus looked to Peter, turned to Peter, uh, the apostle Peter, and said, Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. In 1 Peter, his letter, he claims to be begotten unto a lively Hope in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad that we serve a risen Savior? Amen. That Jesus is alive and well. When everything's out of control down here, He's in control up there. When everything's wrong down here, He's right up there. He's a begotten us again unto a lively hope. Second Peter, the second letter he wrote, the Apostle Peter claims to know the Savior Jesus Christ. That's exactly how he says it. Our Savior Jesus Christ. Salvation was just the beginning for the Apostle Peter. The Lord put a call on, on Peter's blood bought line. Can I tell you that salvation is just the beginning for you too? Uh, the day that Jesus saved me, He wasn't done with me, but that was just where He started. He was going to work on me and He's going to work on you. And Peter had a call on his life. He had a specific call uh, for the Apostle Peter, he was called to be an Apostle. And you're not going to be called to be an Apostle. That was Peter's calling. He was going to be called to be a pastor. If you love me, feed my sheep. That's what Jesus told the Apostle Peter. Some of you are not going to be called to be pastors. That was Peter's calling, and it was specific to him. But Peter was also called with a general calling that is common to every born again believer and that is that he would be called to be a fisher of men to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ in this life if you're here and you're still sucking in air if you're still on this side of the ground friend you've got a purpose in this life if you're a believer you are called to be a fisher of men he had a calling on his life he had a visit from the Lord and this all changed uh, this all changed Peter's whole life. It messed with his mind in a good way, you might say. He tried to run away, but it didn't seem to work out for him. He tried to deny the Lord, but his heart wasn't in it. He tried to go back to fishing, but it just didn't seem the same anymore. All that he could do is to serve the Lord and and, uh, and, and, and and that was that was what he did. His heart wasn't in rebellion anymore. He had been saved and his life had been changed. An encounter with Christ had changed his life. I'll tell you this morning, an encounter with Christ will change your life. I'm not telling you you're going to stop sinning. I'm not going to say you'll never have any problems. But there's a change of heart. And the rebel against God, our heart's just not in it anymore. And aren't you glad and thank God that He came by our way and we had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Not only that, but the Apostle Peter had been studying the Scriptures. In chapter 1 and verse 16, we're not going to get into Judas this morning. That's a sermon for another day. But I want to point out something to you. Chapter 1 and verse 16, uh, it says that, uh, that Peter said, Men and brethren, the Scripture must needs have been fulfilled. Peter had been looking into the Scripture. And then in chapter 2 and verse 16, he tells on this on the day of Pentecost, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Peter had been studying the Scriptures. It's interesting to me that the Apostle Peter recognized that the Scriptures were inspired. Chapter 1 and verse 16, he said, he said, uh, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake. The Apostle Peter recognized here that the Scriptures were inspired by God. This is not some fairy tale that he had drummed up from old Hebrew folklore, but this was the living Word of God that was inspired by the Holy Ghost. And men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you this morning, if you've got a Bible in your lap, it is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God Straight from God to man. And we recognize it as being different and far above any other book that has ever been written. Also, he recognized the prophetic truth of God's Word. He talked about Judas later on here in Acts chapter number 1. In Psalms chapter 41 and verse 9, uh, the, the psalmist David writes about how Judas would betray the Lord Jesus Christ, how one would betray him. Peter applies this to, uh, to that Old Testament psalm. He recognizes that what it said in the Old Testament, that the promises of God were sure and they were true and they were fulfilled in the New Testament. I'm telling you this morning that every word that's said in the Word of God is true. You can trust it. What he says will happen, will happen. What he says he will do, he will do. He began to see that modern day, see modern day application to an ancient word. In Psalms 109 and verse 8, the psalmist writes and says, let another take his office. The Apostle Peter applies that over here in Acts chapter number 1 to Judas. We need to find one to take his office. That's what's coming up. In Joel chapter number 2, the Lord said, I will pour out my spirit. And over here in Acts chapter number 2, he, uh, the Apostle Peter, that is, applies this. He, in his mind, he's thinking, could this be? Uh, talking, or at least in part, talking about the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon them. He recognized a application. And I want to tell you this morning that this old Bible, though it's thousands of years old, this old Bible is more relevant than this morning's newspaper. Part of equipping us to serve the Lord in days of trouble is getting into our minds the Scriptures and the Word of God. And much of the Word of God is taken into our minds long before the time of application ever comes. I want to say this, Sunday school teachers, keep on pounding John 3.16. Keep on memorizing those, uh, those old verses of Scripture because it needs to be in our mind and one of these days the application will be made. He had been studying the Scriptures. Number three, what happened to Peter? He had been praying and talking to God. In chapter 1 and verse 14, it tells us they were all gathered in that upper room and they continued with one accord in prayer and in supplication. The apostle Peter had been praying. He had been praying in a time of waiting. A time of waiting. What were they waiting on? They were waiting on the coming of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit. I want to say this this morning. Thank God we're not waiting on the Holy Spirit of God. If you're saved this morning, you already have the Holy Spirit living in you. When you got saved, you got all of the Holy Spirit. It's an immediate thing. We're not waiting on the Holy Ghost. If Peter could recognize that the Scriptures were inspired, how much more should we as believers be able to recognize 
the inspiration of the Scriptures. If Peter could recognize the prophetic truth of the Bible, then how much more being filled with the Holy Ghost should we be able to recognize that every word of God of God's Word is true? If Peter could make an application in modern day of an ancient word, how much more we being filled with the Holy Ghost should be able to apply God's Word to our life. We're not waiting on the Holy Ghost. But I'll tell you this, uh, we are trying to serve the Lord while we're in a day of waiting. What are we waiting on? We're waiting on the COVID-19 to move out, aren't we? Somebody ought to say amen. I'm ready for this thing to get out of here. Uh, we're, we're waiting on, 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 on to see what the new president's going to do and all of his business. We're waiting on the economy to pick up. We're waiting on some comfort that God has promised that He would bring to our life at some point if we would be patient and wait upon Him. We're, we're waiting. The rest of us are just waiting for Jesus to come. We're trying to serve the Lord in a time of waiting. Can I tell you this? I think you'll agree. It's easy to let our minds run away, to run wild with us in times of waiting. Negativity, pessimism creeps into our hearts and in our minds and takes over our whole attitude and we can talk ourselves into believing that this coronavirus is never going to end and we can talk ourselves into believing that a four-year presidential term is never going to end and we can talk ourselves into believing that Jesus is never coming, that God has forgotten about us, that comfort and help is not on the way. But if we will pray... The best thing we can do in the time of waiting is pray. And God will remind us. And God will fill our hearts. And I'm sure it's in the Proverbs somewhere. I couldn't find it. But I want to say this. A full heart has got to be better than a crazy mind. Pray. It was praying. It was prayed up. How's your prayer life? Number four. I want to say this. It was in this state that Peter found within himself the strength and courage to stand up for Jesus in the evil day. Chapter 3, Peter will have the opportunity to stand for Jesus before an individual. There's a lame man that God puts in his way, been, been uh, crippled since birth, and he lays there in the, in the way at the gate toward the temple, the gate that is called Beautiful, and he begs for alms. He begs for money for those that come through. And it just so happens, if you believe it, it just so happened that Peter and James passed that way. I want to know this morning, who's that one that God has put in your way? Say, preacher, I, I don't have anything to offer anybody. Yes, you do. You've got every bit as much as what the Apostle Peter had to offer. He told that crippled man, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. He gave him the Lord Jesus Christ. You may not have anything to offer, but you've got a story. You've got a testimony, if you're saved, of how Jesus saved your soul. In chapter 1, he had had the opportunity to stand in the midst of the church and state an item, of, an item of business that he felt needed to be addressed, talking about the replacement of Judas in the, uh, as an apostle. And uh, we'll get into uh, uh, whether or not they should have done that. We'll get into that in another lesson. But I just want to say this. It was on Peter's heart. He felt like it needed to be addressed. And he stood up in the church. Is God dealing with you about you standing up for Him in the church? Maybe a call to service. Maybe a, 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 more, a more faithful attendance. Maybe you need to surrender to the ministry. I doubt that the Apostle Peter felt like he would be the last preacher that was ever called into the ministry. I doubt the Apostle Paul or Timothy felt like they were going to be the last ones. Can I tell you this morning? I doubt unless Jesus comes today that I'm going to be the last preacher that's ever called from the Highland Missionary Baptist Church. Maybe that's some of you young men. Maybe that's your calling today. In chapter 2, he would take his stand among strangers and unbelievers. On the day of Pentecost, he would attempt to try to explain what the Lord was doing 
in his heart, and in his church. The result, 3,000 people were saved and baptized and added to the church roll. Preacher, that's not going to happen. If I stand up in, 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 in my crowd at work, and no 3,000 people are going to be, I don't even know 3,000 people at this the moment. Somebody say it. It's not going to happen. Maybe not. But if just one person got saved, wouldn't it be worth it? I was thinking about these, we've attended two funerals this week. I was thinking about preaching funerals that was kind of on my mind this week. It's an honor to be asked by our people to, to preside or officiate or whatever you want to call it, preach a funeral for somebody that has made a profession of faith that we're assured is in heaven. And it was an honor to preach Miss Tammy's funeral, but... Can I tell you, I preached a lot of funerals of people that I didn't even know the person that was in the casket and barely knew the people that asked me to preach the funeral. And I can tell you, as a preacher, that's a hard thing to do. Put yourself in the preacher's shoes. What do you say about somebody when you don't know if they're saved or not? What do you talk about? Uh, it's a strength from another world that we rely on in times of... Preacher, why do you do that? You're not obligated to preach anybody's funeral. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. Because if one person gets saved, if one person has the opportunity to hear the gospel that's never heard it before, then I'll be put in that awkward position. What about you? You stand in the, in the face of people that you know are strangers and unbelievers. In chapter 4, the Apostle Peter would find himself standing for Jesus in the face of, upper, of, of, of opposition in the, in, in the, right in the midst of the religious and political world of his day. And I tell you, they were not happy about his preaching. In fact, it says they were grieved at his words. They didn't like what he had to say about the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't like what he had to say about the resurrection from the dead in Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, there's a whole world of people outside, folks, that don't like what we're preaching in here. They don't like what we're preaching about Jesus. They don't like what we're preaching about salvation. They don't like what we preach about sin. What are we going to do? What are you going to do in the face of opposition. I can tell you this. I can tell you what was going on through Peter's mind from time to time in his humanity, from time to time in the flesh. He was thinking, I wish I was back mending my nets. I wish I was back fishing again. I'm tired of facing the opposition. I'm tired of having people look sideways. What will we do when opposition is standing in front of us? Why didn't he? Why didn't he just quit? Why didn't the Apostle Peter just walk away? Just walk away from the Lord. He was already saved. His, his, his heavenly home was secure. Uh, he was going to heaven when he died. Why didn't he just walk away from the Lord and walk away from the church and walk away from the ministry and just get out of all of that? It's real simple. Because the Lord had put a burden in his heart a burden in his heart for lost souls. A burden in his heart for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. A burden in his heart for the church. And Peter's words were simply this. I cannot help but speak the things which I have seen and heard. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, the invitation is extended to you. Jesus is still saying, come and follow me. Jesus is still saying, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is still saying to the lost person, the lost sinner, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, you should be washed white as snow. The invitation is extended to all who are not saved this morning. 
And I want to reiterate this again. The time to accept that invitation from Christ is now. Can I tell you again, it may be a now or never situation. Would you trust Him this morning? If you're a believer and the Lord's dealing with your heart about something, uh, some way that you need to be serving Him, you need to know He's not going to give up on it. God's not going to forget about it. This thing, what God's dealing with you about, is not going to go away. You can go back to mending nets if you choose to, but you'll go without joy, without peace, and comfort and strength in the Lord. My prayer today is, Lord, don't give us a moment's peace until we've surrendered our lives to you. What about you this morning? Would you come as we sing a verse of invitation? 164. And number 164.